Hello gamers and welcome to another exciting edition of Game Warp. I'm Owood. I'm Kim. And tonight we're going to be looking at Life is Strange 2. Life is Strange 2 is the much anticipated follow-up to original Life is Strange, a game which so far we've seen the prequel, uh, Life is Strange Before the Storm. Um, but here we're presented with a completely new story and new characters, uh, but still working on a concept that helps build the world of Life is Strange as we this time follow the Wolf Brothers who consist of uh, Sean and Daniel who due to a unfortunate circumstance where where Daniel discovers he has telepathic abilities uh, and an incident which leads to the father being being killed in uh, police uh, interference the pair set up set out on a road trip from Seattle to Mexico and uh, over the course of five episodes we follow their journey as they encounter various friends and foes alike while avoiding the uh, the rest by the police force now Kim I mean this is obviously a game we've been excited to see i mean we've actually held off on playing it until we had all the chapters out and it's actually worked out quite nicely the fact yeah. it is available on game pass as well which really helps um and yeah i mean it's safe to say i mean life is strange was a big game for ourselves it's what we essentially came together to form to do this podcast about because we both wanted to play life is strange and then we obviously were through the uh, show we've also looked at before the storm as well which yeah, we looked at Awesome Adventures of Captain Spirit. Exactly, which was the was it was kind of the precursor to this this game, and um, now we're obviously presented with the two brothers, Daniel and uh, Sean. And I have to ask first of all, I mean, how do they obviously compare in regards to our previous um, uh, protagonists we followed, obviously with Max and Chloe, and perhaps to an extent Rachel. The uh, the time travel story we obviously looked at when we were in Arcadia Bay and. I mean, obviously, with that story, it was all in one central location. We had those wonderful sort of like Twin Peaks nods and a lot of really cool pop culture. And now we're presented with a story which is more sort of similar to like Into the Wild or of Mice and Men, of just these two brothers setting out in this cross crunchy journey. So it's a much larger canvas already that we're being exposed to rather than having this small town setting with sort of like the dark secrets uh hidden within now we're sort of out in the out in the real world and uh struggling to uh survive from sort of the very real world dangers that sort of surround these two brothers as they attempt to find their place and also protect the secret of uh of of um daniel's powers life is strange 2 has a much more serious tone i think um especially because it chooses to use the america of you know pretty much what trump is building right i mean a lot of the uh, people you meet and the world around you hints towards um a lot of the racism and prejudices towards immigrants and illegal immigrants and mexicans and 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 just in general you know it looks at a lot of these little elements of, you know, obviously I had really like, you know, I think anything, anytime I see like brothers on the road, it always seems like something bad is going to happen. Maybe it's that uh, Grave of the Firefly <laughs> syndrome that I have. It is always the issue, isn't it? Whenever you've got the, uh, the two siblings looking out for each other, you know that one of them isn't going to perhaps make it to the end of the story. Yeah, and, and, I, and, and I think that maybe one of the endings that was I think I read up on some of the endings and 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 I think one of the endings is that one of them doesn't make it out or something like that. But I don't I don't remember. I didn't get that ending, so I I didn't I don't know. But we'll talk about endings later. Um, I mean the main the main focus of this story I think lies in the fact that Sean is guiding Daniel as an older brother. He's taking care of him, and the choices that you make in essence is what influences Daniel's morality. So Daniel's morality is the main thing here that will affect every decision that happens after, especially like the bigger decisions and to how he reacts to you. Um, like obviously in this one, you already feel right away that, I mean, I think one of the biggest things we had with Life, Life is Strange, while it was like a wonderful story and Chloe and Max was written so well, um, 
it had less of a flexible, like you felt less that your decisions made that much of a difference in the long run. Whereas like in this one, you can really see that, I mean, at the end, especially when, you know, after every chapter, we get to see like what choices could have happened. And a lot of times you have four choices that, you know, that could have happened. And, and, and I think that that's really interesting is that that shows that don't nod is really, you know, they're building that mechanic of being able to give your characters like your decisions actually make a bigger impact. So as you make more decisions and influence Daniel's morality, the chances of him and how he reacts to the situation and and, you know, how lethal his powers are being used or in control or not in control is going to be is going to be a big factor that plays in as the as you go through each of the episode as as you know, his powers get better and, you know, he's learned a lot more about it. Definitely so. I think certainly when it comes to these interactive adventures, I think this might be one of the deepest titles to date that we have seen. And while on the surface it may seem that you're going to obviously all end up at the same point, there's many more deeper elements to the story, um, such as, you know, who Sean falls in love with. As you said, will the sort of moral path that Daniel will take, and these sort of details really start coming in into into effect in the later chapters. These, while in sort of like the first three chapters, you think you're making choices and it's not making a huge amount of difference to the story. It's really when you get into these last couple of chapters that you really start see it feeling the sort of price of the choices that you've made these connections that you have with the world around you will start coming more and more into play and certainly in like terms of like who you've got relations with and and as you said already with daniel it's like how he's choosing to use his powers because early on in the game you're given you're given a set of rules that sean outlines for his brother basically for their own protection because he knows that if anyone discovers that Daniel has these powers that they're basically going to separate them they're going to take him away and they're going to be they're going to risk exposing themselves so they got to live by these they got to live by these rules of hiding his powers and not just using them for sort of evil or for their own personal sort of gain and it's up to you whether you actually choose to follow these rules or not and I think it's the game does such a good job of putting your re- yourself really in the mindset of Sean where you're this 16 year old kid who's thrust into adulthood where he's forced to become the surrogate parent to his younger brother Daniel who at the same time is dealing with this almost like pubescent awakening within him he's sort of like got all these mixed feelings he's got this amazing power he's sort of like do, do am I still just like a regular kid or do I just am I just like this something else am I just this all powerful being that doesn't have to follow the same rules as everyone else because I can I have these powers and that are only getting stronger as the story is going on so I think that you know it's it's interesting because obviously we're not controlling Daniel and and to think that Sean has all this power to influence him I think that a part of the story has to be on rails to a certain extent like events that happen are going to happen regardless of what choice you make. It just depends, you know, like how you get from point A to point B. And and I think that, you know, because of how you get there, that this is how the situation will change for everyone. Um, everyone will have a different kind of story put together in, in a certain way. And it's refreshing to see that because obviously, like you said, I mean, no, don't not entertainment isn't kind of like a studio that is like you know Quantic Dream or something who who makes you know Heavy Rain and 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 Detroit Become Human or or ga- games with you know so much more budget behind them and yet you know Life is Strange too is able to use that budget to kind of still grow I think I think that's the biggest thing is um, just seeing them you know be able to use those mechanics of you know choices and dialogue to a certain degree and. And the dialogue is pretty decent. I mean, like a lot of a lot of like uh, how things are going is good. I, ju- I just feel like with anything in life is strange. There's always this element of um, of of just like no matter what choice you make, you're gonna be doomed. <laughs> Something bad is gonna happen, and that's like the most unsettling thing. It's like choosing what's the lesser evil here, um, and I think that that's one of the. I think that's one of the thing is that maybe there should be a little bit more of like a reward but not like always every decision you make because i think at a certain point in episode one i got i got really frustrated 
And I was just like, I was like, what is this? I'm being such a nice person here. I'm trying to do the right thing. And then I still get mm. screwed over. And then I and then I lashed out and I made a bad decision, right? And then and then you make that bad decision and it comes to haunt you in the end, right? So you're you're kind of like it's all it, it's all a matter of I think like just seeing how much you think about that situation and how you want your characters to move along because at the beginning you don't really see that much of you know you're you don't feel the influence it's a very subtle they've done it in a, such a subtle way yeah. and certainly done with the first chapter of this game it's all about testing your own morality there's certain moral choices that you have to make um throughout the the first one and it really sort of establishes what moral line you're going to follow because you have the option of like do you steal money from the from the family fun jar to fund your out and do you steal the beer and you you do um take certain certain things and it like comes down to you have this conversation with your father and it's sort of like do you admit that you're going to be doing these things or don't you admit to them and it kind of rewards you for being honest um we're setting the path that i took and it, when we get out into the, the real world and you realize that you know that that small amount of money that you decide to keep rather than going for the large amount of money you take really comes to bite you because it's all like well if i had stolen all the money then i'd be better off once i get into the real world and stuff so it's uh sometimes mm -hmm. the bad choices are the ones you need to make but it uh it really loves to play around with those moral choices for sure um and you've got yeah, and, and you know... I was yeah, just about to say, it's just like when you get into the real world and you get into those sort of survival situations and the pe the groups that you find yourself in, the sort of the choices you make will become very sort of dependent on the situation that you find yourself in, like where your moral line suddenly like shifts to, like what would normally would be mm -hmm. unacceptable to you when you're like living at home and got this comfortable life, completely different when you're like out living like the life of a freight hopper for example pretty much i mean like i think that that that's one of the main things is you know as you're going these these boys are growing up and while the story you know stretches over like a a, a decent amount of time i would say uh you know we we go through i think like months and months and months i mean we we started in what it was like uh maybe like halloween of the year yeah. before and then it was it was like July the 4th, the next year that it ends or something. A decent amount of time has passed by. Um, you know, it gives a time for these brothers to kind of like meet these people. And I think one of those main things is the people you meet also brings up a different part of, you know, educating them on growing up. And the different, you know, family things that they need to mend. And, and it learns, and they learn a little bit more, you know, on a personal level about you know their their mom and and uh, their grandparents and and obviously you know just making friends and and things that might or might not threaten their brotherly bond and i think one of the main elements is when when you know Sean and Daniel they they are connected to each other but at the same time they're both growing up so there's always that moment, I think in episode three was where we had a changing point where Daniel feels like Sean is ditching him for mm. his friends and not taking care of him as much. And then he kind of lashes out. He has that kind of like youth rebellious moment, which is happening a lot earlier because now he's had to grow up in this world being a lot more lost about, you know, his powers and everything that's going on. So he's finding himself by himself. And a lot of this time, because he's doing that, maybe some of his morality shifts and and i think episode three was one of those really frustrating moments because sometimes like the story was on rails in a certain way where it made sean be kind of like even though i knew what had to be done for sean to not to mend this brotherly you know this brotherly relationship i couldn't like the, the game wouldn't let me make those choices because it had to have these things happen in order for a certain you know the big event to end the to end that episode. Certainly, I mean Wastelands, um, as in Chapter Three, is very frustrating because it is just basically about Sean finally getting to 
sort of get that piece of his, the life he lost back where he's sort of hanging out with people with his own sort of age and having that sort of social experience and meanwhile Daniel's sort of pushed to the side he's been he's basically let, been left to his own devices which obviously means that he's got the opportunity to sort of run astray with his his powers and we also learn at this point just how powerful Daniel's become in the the months which have passed that well initially he sort of struggles to lift like stones now he's pulling like whole tree trunks out of the lake and we had that moment where he has one of his big big power spikes where he like pulls the tree trunk of the lake and he's sort of like i'm not a kid anymore and you realize like what you're essentially dealing with is just like a an atom bomb in the in the body of a nine-year-old child that can like basically yeah. blow off at any time and take out like most people in the sort of the surrounding area, which is obviously this catalyst through the you two being on the road in the first place. Um, the problem I have with the chapter three is that there's whole swathes of dialogue that the writers clearly thought was going to be the most fascinating thing for people to sit through. And there's a scene where this group of um, of uh, freight hoppers they're they're sort of sitting around the campfire and they're all saying like how they came to be on the road and stuff and they're like god i just enough already let me skip this i'm not i don't want to go around the group and listen to four people tell these long-winded ass stories well my only option is to throw <laughs> acorns on a fire get drunk or get stoned <laughs> can imagine imagine i did none of those you things. just sat there. i sat through the entire thing <laughs> I was like looking around going, what can I do? It's like, look up at Sky and I'm thinking, you know, that's more something. I'm doing something. <laughs> yeah, but I, I think, you know, it, it, you know, all things aside, I think, you know, Wastelands is one that was was a meant to be the, the turning point, right? It was it's a middle episode. It It's meant to be that turning point where Sean suddenly realizes, you know, Daniel's changed that through all this <coughs> him kind of finding back his freedom, Daniel really hasn't. Because Daniel is still stuck in, in you know, trying to find this part of him that he believes he's all-powerful, but yet he's a nine-year-old, so he doesn't quite understand that. You know, I think that, you know, between trying to get attention and, and trying to, you know, prove that he's not a child anymore, he's, you know, he's kind of, he's a, he's a bit of a brat. In, in the third one, you know, like he, he whines and he complains a lot. And then he really like tries to challenge the, the limits of Sean towards like what he can do without, you know, like kind of without really realizing that, you know, the things that you do has a consequence, just like, you know, how it ends up, you know, making them lose the job and, and, and them having all those, having all those issues because, you know, obviously they're working on a pot farm. It's not, it's not, it's, it's an illegal operation. You know, these people need to be really careful about who they hire as well, right? You can't be just messing around. So he doesn't realize the, the danger of the situation. So I think in that sense, they still preserve that fact that, you know, Daniel still lacks that kind of decisiveness that he needs to have because he is still a kid. As much as he's grown up and he doesn't think, you know, he thinks that he can do so much because he has that power. There are still a lot of shortcomings, and I think that episode was a really great point that that you know that pointed up that that kind of like highlight that that aspect. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I really took away from from episode three, uh, though, is just the fact that the, the real sort of focus is on who's Sean going to be knocking sh knocking boots with. I mean, is he going to be with the? <laughs> I didn't knock didn't with you? anybody. So well, you have the. This no. is um. This is. I didn't. I didn't go swim in the. La I got the choice to go swim in the lake okay. with Cassidy, and I didn't do it. So, and then I know that I was reading up that you could have had, you could have kissed Finn or something like that, and I didn't. I didn't get yeah. that option. So, um, we have to three it really makes, sort of makes a lot of character choices for for Sean of where you're going to be. I mean, you can get a haircut, you can get a tattoo, you can choose to have a relationship with Finn who's just annoying as all sin or you can go knock boots with the uh, hippie chick Cassidy who's sort of the better of the two bad options here and yes you can you can totally screw that up or you can as I said uh, go have your your moment with her which 
it adds some minor backstory. I mean, the sadly is that neither of them are going to end up being characters which follow you on your journey. I mean, this is always about Daniel and Sean, this journey. It's never really about anyone else sort of tagging along. You encounter people and they sort of drop in and they drop in out of your journey. Like, you you meet like a travel blogger named Brody and at the start of each episode mm. it retells the events of the previous episode but in the form of like a yeah. like a Ghibli sort of storyline where you've got these two wolves like a, oh yeah it's it's meant to be their their bedtime story right that that Sean makes for Daniel in the first episode and then it carries forward as as the time is going through that they're spending together the story builds and he writes it as you know the wolves because they they call themselves wolves so they're the wolf brothers and and i think that that's that's nice like like i think the the beginning of the episode is nice i find it a little tedious that they have to start from the beginning every single time and then retell the whole story it's like you know i have amnesia or something and i forgot but then i think it's because you know obviously we're binge playing this and people are playing this episode by episode so it's a different feeling i mean to that to that point especially i really want to say that this is a game which i think if we played episode by episode as it was coming out i think the experience would have been more enjoyable than trying to binge this because it's a very heavy story it's like trying to trying to yeah. consume like five heavy meals in one go where it's supposed to be like a series <laughs> of like a, a dinner parties that you attend you like go and you have you have this experience and you go off and play something lighter, you know. You could play Spider Man or the mm-hmm. Division or something like that, so where you get some more involvement in your gameplay. Yeah. Um whereas yeah. if you play this But I mean I mean like I think the main thing I wanna ask in, in, in like how you feel about is that, you know, obviously Sean and Daniel go through in these five episodes very different stories. Um, you know, obviously we were talking about wastelands where, you know, they worked on a pot farm. But then, you know, we go into, you know, Daniel gets caught in a cult and then we have issues, you know, we go live with the grandparents. And then how do you feel about, you know, all these stories? Like, do you feel like they add meaning because of the different pit stops that they made and and the people they meet? Certainly when you look at it as a bigger picture. So when you're playing playing through, it seems like a lot of times it's like, oh, it's another tedious sort of stop off. It's sort of like I really want to be getting on to the, the next the next thing but when you look at it as a larger picture then all these events sort of really sort of add up and and make this sort of fuller story um so they make a lot more sense it's sort of like yes we you know were initially on the road and that we have to hide out this abandoned cabin and it's through this the longer on the road the more we sort of make these connections like you know we reconnect with the grandparents we we are joining with the freight hoppers or um I have to rescue Daniel from this cult. So as a as the story sort of like builds, build, it builds up a really nice as a, a story. But obviously, if you're binge playing, it's a little hard to see see the bigger picture until you sort of like stop and think about the journey you've taken. You still yeah. take that moment to sort of stop and look back at you know all these events which have played their part and yeah. Um, but I mean. I mean, I mean, I think that I think the thing is, you know, it's how you feel about I think like I think Life is Strange 2 does something a little bit different than Life is Strange in general or the two previous games is that Life is Strange 2 is a much more like like I said in the beginning, it was much more serious. There's so many issues of, you know, racism. And then we talk about you know, <coughs> illegal Im- immigrants and then every single episode we're talking about something, you know, uh, kind of like uh society problem pretty much and and it all snowballs into the fact that you know they're you know we even i get to see the the wall and and all that stuff that that you know that that gets built between you know u.s and mexico and all these things are 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 pointing to kind of like you know even even in the beginning in the first episode we have the cop that that shoots down uh shoots down their dad and it's just because he gets nervous because he's 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 mm. Mexican, and and all these issues are pointing to you know actual problems that you know actual uh, issues that are going on in the U.S. and actual things that are going on about you know towards all these things and I and I feel like you know to a certain extent Don't Nod is is trying to use games to you know kind of 
raise an issue of the morality of different situations, of how you should treat certain situations. Because I think in the end, one of the biggest questions you have by the end is that everybody questions Sean also throughout is, if he did nothing wrong, why did he run? And and that was one of the that was one of the biggest things that you take away is, you know, like the decision of whether like because if he didn't run, what would have happened? We wouldn't have a game, obviously. But if if, if if he didn't run, I mean, would he have been you know what would he have been accused of of of, of killing? the cop because obviously the cop was killed because you know we can only assume the cop was killed because suddenly daniel daniel's power awoke and then it just like caused a huge yeah you know huge disaster right that's right i mean the whole i mean it 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 takes that sort of typical um idea of powers awakening for a moment of a trauma because it's always the same it's if it's um if it's a male character it's always a moment of trauma that triggers the awakening of powers where if it's a female character you notice that it will always be um an awakening be a more pubescent awakening you normally see it signified by things such as like periods of menstruation or like sexual awakening because we see like in with rogue in x-men or you see in like ginger <laughs> snaps you see um Nothing, no one does, I'm telling you, if you haven't seen this German movie called um, Blue My Mind, that, that one takes it to the whole new <laughs> level. Um, whole yeah, level. and it's it's kind of frustrating. Like, in the first episode, you have this outline of the game, and you also get to hang out with one of my favorite characters in the game, who sadly doesn't appear past the first one, uh, first chapter, though you do get to speak to on the phone in one of the episodes, and that's Lila, who I just absolutely... I didn't. I didn't call Lila, so I didn't oh, even get to talk about her. Oh, I love and adore <laughs> Lila so much. She's like the most awesome character in this whole game, and she's like your female cohort. She's your best friend, and she's like your wingman. She's like everything to John. And in the the opening of the the first one, you're sort of plot. You're planning to go to this party because there's this girl that you really wants to get with, and. There's so many little elements in that first that uh, doing the home sequence, like if you put music on in his bedroom and you talk to her on the webcam, she responds to, to the music you're playing. And I thought, oh, that was really sort of cool. Mm-hmm. And the story, I thought that, you yeah, know, we're going to get to go to this party. We're going to have all these like moments and it'd be, we give these like um, Life is Strange sort of moments where we get to, you know, hang out and be teenagers in this, this town in Seattle. Uh, but sadly, it's not the case. You get all this sort of snatched away just as you're getting comfortable with it because of obviously this key event that obviously puts uh, the brothers instead on the road. And it's interesting, obviously, the fact that you mentioned, obviously, there's all these sort of like stabs at Trump's, Trump's America that these two boys are traveling across. And there's obviously incidents of racism and discrimination that they will encounter um, either together or individually as throughout the course of their journey. But the sort of end game for for this one and i'm, I'm going to say spoiler alert now that if you actually make it to mexico the boys become career criminals which i thought it's a real questionable thing <laughs> where if you don't go into mexico then you know he goes to he um sort of like serves his time and i thought it's crazy though because because it because you know the the deal is I think that in the in the end what happens because i chose i didn't i didn't make it to mexico i did i i i decided to confess yeah. up so I ended up going to jail. Like I, I put Sean in jail for what? Fifteen, 15 years, years he serves like in jail. And I was and I was crazy. I was just like fifteen years. That's incredible because because in reality, yes, he did a lot of wrong things. But in the end, it it was because he ran that made the situation worse. That's why he couldn't explain himself out of it. Mm. So you were punished for having a game to play <laughs> in the end. Like we went through all these events and it was all wrong. But didn't right? we have the same issue with the first Life is Strange and the fact that you have to choose whether you save Chloe or you save Arcadia Bay? Yeah, but because because here is a bit different because I was reading up that you could have four different endings and the four different endings would change in 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 the fact that it would dis- depend on how much you have influenced, whether you influence Daniel's morality in a good or bad way. So he would have reacted differently in the sense that, like, right now, if I cho- like when I chose to fess up, Daniel didn't use his powers to mm. change anything. Like, if not, he would have, like, forced his way or something, and I think he would have, he would have gone, he would have made it across 
to Mexico by himself or whatever. And and in the other circumstances, it would have been, you know, if they both went through, there was a positive and a negative to that as well. So it would depend on how Daniel and how you raise, like how you influence his morality that affects which ending, which of the four endings you were going to get. And I think that that's pretty interesting because I was, I was always like kind of a bit like halfway through, I started feeling like a bit as I was reading through the different options that you can get um, throughout, you know, the different things, whenever we had like four options that could happen, I was always wondering, well, how would that happen? You know, because I didn't get that choice and I didn't see that choice happening. And then, and then as I was like looking more into it, like the game is more about you being a brother and how you being that, you know, kind of like a teaching kind of like a, a morality figure, a role model to Daniel, that your decisions really affect how he's going to react. And I think to a certain extent, that's where, that's where I think the game kind of has some issues because, because it's hard to do a game like that where you can influence your little brother's decision, but in the end, you don't really know what decision he's going to make until it happens. Definitely so. And it's... And sometimes it's like you think you think you made that decision and then he's not going to react the way that you expect him to. Something else that um, I found really so interesting that as we're obviously talking about now and we obviously talk about the fact that we have Sean who's sort of forced into this role of being a parent that we, on the road, we eventually catch up with um, their estranged mother, Karen, who mm-hmm. we're told for how to abandon them when they were, t- were children. And... Um, they've had no contact with and that through um obviously daniel being sort of brought being captured by this and brainwashed by this cult that uh, she makes this reappearance and there's these scenes where she's reconnected with sean and she's trying to explain why she left because she didn't feel like a complete person and it explores these pressures of 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 being a parent um this idea that you suffer this loss of self Sean's essentially had the same choice that that she was faced with. It's sort of like, you know, do do I look after my little brother or do I sort of abandon him and and do I just sort of like look after myself, look out for myself? And yeah. it's kind of interesting the fact that when they reconnect that both of them have sort of faced this situation and both have gone in different paths, obviously. And I don't, I mean, it gives you the option. You can be as hard or as soft as you want on on Karen when you reconnect with her, which I thought was was good because it depends on sort of how frustrated you are. You can sort of really work out some frustration on her if you so wish. So I did find it, him a little too trusting of his mother suddenly appearing and he's suddenly like a little too trusting of her, should we say. Um... Well, I don't know. I, I think I, I mean, for me, I, I, tried, to, I tried to see, I, because I think I really fell into the Sean perspective. And the Sean perspective in my mind was that he's going through the same thing that his his mother went through, those same decisions. And he's chosen to be there for Sean, uh, for, for, for Daniel, no matter what happens. And because of that, I was able to kind of like show a bit of empathy towards her and, and a bit more sympathetic for her situation and understanding about what was going on. So, you know, as I was looking at the things that she was saying, obviously, you know, you hear her out and, you know, you give that opportunity, but it's maybe it's just my personality. I'm like that also. I chose the path to forgive her and give her that chance because it was also the fact that you really needed her help. And I didn't know if you pissed her off how much she'd help you and how, how much she'd <laughs> risk to, to help you get Daniel out of out of the cult. So, you know, like a lot of these things play into play into, you know, like obviously anything choice driven is always about the relationships that you have. And you, you just never know how much of the bridge you can burn, right? Definitely. So it's, I think this, this is a thing, even though you know that the game is essential rails for a lot of uh, a good majority of it, there's still this, this feeling that if you piss off the wrong people that you're going to, going to lose those paths. Something that it, I think it misleads you with when um, you look at the Cassidy storyline in how choosing certain choices can you, um, can really affect your your relationship with her and the fact she just storms off suddenly. Um, and the fact you don't get to make mm. up with her if, if she does storm off, you're just like drawn straight into the, the finale of that story, which is a little frustrating, shall we say, if you're wanting to um, pursue the romantic options there. 
but I have to say that the in terms of the romance here, your options are not the best. I know. I suppose it depends on how much you like weird hippie chicks. I I don't know. I've been I've been getting into like I've been getting into the the whole thing. I've been going through a phase of the fact that a romance story should be about romance, but other stories don't need to have romance. So that's why I deliberately in this one tried to avoid okay. all of that. So I didn't make the initiative for any of it. So I was like, I didn't want to get together with Cassidy, and I didn't know I could get together with Finn, and um, it, it didn't bother me. I didn't want Sean to go on that path, because you know that at that point of the story, that you're trying to mend your relationship with your brother, who's kind of losing it a little with his powers. So in the weighing of, you know, the, the good and bad, like, like what's more important... I chose I chose Daniel as my priority more than choosing, you know, I was thinking, well, if I refused all this and I went back, then it would make a difference. But obviously it didn't. It doesn't because we know that, you know, the ending of that episode was supposed to happen yeah. no matter what. It just depends on what you choose and what happens to you kind of thing. I mean, certainly what I I, th- I mean, I certainly appreciate the fact that the game obviously does try to tie in your choices from if you played Life is Strange, if you played Captain Spirit, the fact that it takes those those choices that you made uh, in those games and brings it into this game even though don't know have basically said you know we're done with the max and and chloe storyline that's it it's finished yeah. we're not going back to them and it was sort of annoying the fact that they didn't even like appear in passing at all it's just basically like oh look here's where lies arcadia bay or here we're going through arcadia bay so it, it's frustrating because I, I mean i just love max and chloe so much they were just so awesome that was hoping that yeah. you know here we have a here with telepathic powers here we have a go who can control time surely there would be some sort of yeah. bringing together of uh of people here but no it's sadly no what i mean i think i think what would be really interesting at a certain point if they keep building on this world which seems like they're they're really on the path of like telling human stories and human relationship stories about <laughs> people in this world because you know they do a decent job i mean they bring in arcadia bay and then you know um i played um I because I, I had played Life is Strange on PS4 and then I played everything else on Steam. So obviously the only thing they had to go on was my choice that I made about at the beginning about what I chose for Life is Strange. But then they did, you know, transfer my they said that, you know, the Captain Spirit choices were were incorporated yeah. and blah, 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 you know. So so, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, it's a nice it's a nifty little thing. I think that, you know, obviously, as you explore more of the world, you kind of. You know, it's a really nice merge as well. Obviously, I would have liked that more of the passing people would kind of link together. But um, I mean, we did we did get you know David, who was a stepfather in in uh, of Chloe's in in Life is Strange, which does a does appear and he does mention you know the existence of Chloe or the non existence of her <laughs> because she died <laughs> or, or whichever choice you made, right? I don't I don't know what path that could have gone. Um, but I mean. Like, I don't know. I, I'm okay with the whole, you know, building another story um, and using, you know, the topics of what they're trying to go through. And I think that, you know, the, the heart is in the right place as to where the story wants to go for this one. Whenever you talk about brothers and stuff, that's it's a different dynamic from talking about, you know, two people who have, you know, friendship and, and maybe something more than friendship going on, like uh, Max and Chloe. And... What would be really interesting to see at one point is how these people have these powers and where are these powers coming from? Because obviously something very interesting is happening where this world has all these these kids and teenagers who are discovering their their special powers triggered by whatever, right? It'd be interesting to see where else they can take that if they continued on this whole, you know, this world. Like, what would be the next thing they can do? Because obviously you have one who can manipulate kind of like, uh, one can manipulate time, and then now you have one who can manipulate objects. So what would be the next step, right? Like, it'd be interesting to see where Don't Nod is going to go if, you know, if they go for a Life is Strange 3. Um, I'm fairly certain they're not going to be, you know, Sean and Daniel are done now. They're going to move on to something else and... Maybe, you know, we'll we'll see something in between that happens because obviously this story ends in like 2025 or 2033 or something like that. Some some crazy future year. I had to say at the moment it's uh, unclear where they're planning to go next. 
And certainly I don't think we're going to see these characters again, which I think maybe for the best, because I certainly didn't warn him the same way that I did Max and Chloe, as I've, you know, I've highlighted multiple times already, just how, how um, that's what I wanted, but I didn't get. Yeah, but because, you know, the way that they ended Life is Strange, I think they learned a valuable lesson there, is that they they ended the story in a way that they either survived or didn't or didn't survive, right? You either gave up Arcadia Bay or you didn't give up Arcadia Bay. And then both of those things would have had a different impact on, you know, who mm. survived it. And with a story like that, you can't build another story around it. So because if you kept going with Max and Chloe, where else would you go? You would go somewhere like before the storm where you go back to Chloe before Max when Max left. And, you know, we both didn't quite enjoy it as much. You know, there was a lot of a lot busy work, um, um, which again, it yeah. felt like there was a lot in this. Is that this time instead of doing menial tasks, you're just being forced to listen to people. I don't have too big of a problem with the dialogue. I thought the dialogue was fine. I mean, a lot of times these choice driven games are like watching movies. It's just you get to choose your adventure kind of thing a little. You get to control a bit of the outcome. Um, but I think I think you know what what kind of like is 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 really the length. Each episode is is so long. It's like I think episode one or and one and two are like four yeah. hours long, and then and then three, four, five is like three ish. You know, it depends how much how much you know how achievement how many achievements and how much of those optional collectibles you want to get. I got like one or two maybe out of like five. So um, obviously, I thought I was being I thought I was being uh, very, you know, detailed, yeah. but I wasn't. So, <laughs> so yeah, no, I mean, it's, um, it's long, you know, like to jump from the previous one, which was like, you know, an hour and a half to two hours long, a three hour episode. And, you know, you, you try to, you know, whenever you play these games, you try to do an episode in one sitting usually. Right. But in this one, you know, three hours is long i don't even go to movies that are three hours now in the theaters yeah. anymore you know so <laughs> so you know it's it's kind of like um it's it's a lot of focus and it, it's it's you know if you don't keep the engagement it's it becomes kind of like they're it's just a lot of like listening to people and then making choices and then thinking about you know morally what's a better choice or how it's going to change the situation and that's and over a three-hour period, that, that can get a bit tough, right? And then, you know, in the course of the game, you played, like, you know, what, 13, 15 hours or something like that. And and that's just crazy. Yeah, I think if you're going to make me play something for four hours, um, you know, give me an engrossing storyline. Don't make it feel like you've got two, two chapters glued together, which certainly the first one did feel like. It felt that when we have, like, the big introduction of Daniel's powers that you know that was the end point and that the part on the road yeah, like, felt like another chapter altogether it like, it's like no it was like it was like 30 minutes was the prologue <laughs> and then and then hey another two and a half or, or three and a half is gonna be your main roads episode, yeah and it's right? sort of like oh you're gonna go on the road but you're just going to meet like worse people and then even when and even when you think that you've got like uh, a little bit of hope the game sort of snatches away from you like uh, we're mushing the dog so I think that life is strange 2 is a bad game i think that they've definitely improved on say game mechanics and you know um the choice driven elements and that whole you know the branch of the game is the branches that it has is definitely much more thorough than the first one but i think that sean and daniel is a different dynamic to Max and Chloe and they can't really be compared because they're a different type of relationship and they're telling a different story um, you know over a longer period of time like I I, I appreciate what Sean and David uh, Sean and Daniel what they've gone through and whatnot but at the same time you know I think that in the end it's it's really whether you believe that they should have ran away in the first place because I think that everyone they meet who asks that question has a really valid point is that what was their decision to run away in the first place? You know, like why did, was it fear? Was it panic? Was it because, you know, obviously in it at the end of the first episode is when, is when like they finally realize that all this happened, like all the, the cop died was because of Daniel's power. 
Before that, they ran away. They didn't know what happened. They were unconscious. They woke up. He just took Daniel and left. Yeah. So, you know, there, there's a whole thing of, you know, what triggers his powers and then, you know, how to control it and, and all that sort of things that happens. So, you know, what was, you know, did he think he killed the cop? Was it was that, you know, I was kind of waiting for that left shoe to drop, like at the end where it would be like, oh, Sean actually has powers. He was the one who triggered well, the whole thing. Well, I kept waiting you know? for it to happen, but, you know. such as the scene where you encounter the racist in chapter four. That you've got this whole backdrop mm-hmm. there and it, you've got to see the thunder and the lightning out in the background and you've had this moment which is similar to the one which um, triggers Daniel with this sort of moment of violence and extreme trauma where he's just like the pressure's just been increased increased and as I said you see the storm clouds rolling in you see the whole mood and the world around you sort of like tense up and, and then you think right this is going to be the moment his powers are going to trigger and he's also going to have powers and these two wolf brothers are going to you know have um have the psyche ability we're going to see him like totally destroy these two guys but no he just gets his ass handed to him and then you're basically dumped down the desert and it's like oh great (laughs) but that was the thing was i you know i don't know if it was deliberate to kind of like make you have that kind of guesswork but if it was, I have to say, don't nod, big applaud on, you know, really leading me on. <laughs> then uh, not not living up to what you lived up, what you're leading me on on, right? Yeah. <laughs> but, but you know, um, you know, I, I, I'm a little mixed right now. Like, if there was another life, if there was a Life is Strange 3, would you still be intrigued? Because it feels like right now, don't nod is kind of like, you know, Life is Strange was kind of what got them really famous obviously because you know we've talked about remember me which is their actual Mm. first game um and then we talked about you know obviously all the life is strange games but in the middle right now they're coming up with you know they're they're teaming up with bandai to do a a bandai namco to do to do a a game as well and um you know we're seeing don't nod pick up a lot more different projects obviously you know at one point I, i i hope that we'll be able to review vampire or something um something that's you know completely different from this game uh but you know if there was a next life is strange 3 which i'm not sure whether there will be but uh would you would you still be interested i'm interested in playing it especially if we're going to continue this path of just introducing new characters each time because if it was more the wolf brothers then i wouldn't be playing it because i don't really care about these characters the same way they did with max and chloe and i think when it comes to this sort of game it just really needs to, it works best in like the small town setting I think rather than trying to put it on a larger canvas as it just felt like there was so much filler here and they just felt that um, there was so much of the canvas that was just being left unpainted here with the this larger picture they're trying to say whereas when we were in Arcadia Bay it felt like this real full the full like uh, picture that we were being painted we had interesting locations we had this these secrets that we were uncovering as we went and each location felt that it was like fully fleshed out that you could properly explore it and here a lot of locations just feel like you're on a straight path and you don't you can't really you know go off the path because there's nothing to see it's very much mm, it's like the perfect right. analogy for it it's like the scene in uh, chapter 4 where we were walking along the desert road that's what this game feels like in many places you're just constantly just like walking on this one road that it wants you to follow whereas when mm. I was in Arcadia Bay like you know with the, we have the lower and the school and you can like explore around you can go to different uh, sort of places and interact with the different social groups so you can go to like the vortex so you can go to the sawmill club and all these places why they were seemed like smaller just felt like more filled out than what we have here and um it was something that even like before the storm didn't really sort of tap into because it just got so caught up in like telling the story of this relationship um and just like you know generally keeping you occupied with busy work just so they could keep the focus on that so I think one of the things I really did appreciate, and one of those really down times of this game was, was I really like looking for places to sit and sketch. I thought oh, that was no. super the cool. The sketching like, mechanic is so much worse than the, the Polaroid mechanic. Um, 
obviously, but I, I really liked, you know, it was like that moment of kind of like a downtime. And I, and I don't know, I kind of appreciated the fact that you could find these different places. You just sit down and, and then you could just draw. And it would kind of take away in that like little moment where he could reflect and talk about things. Because I think that was one of those elements where it was a bit more soothing than I think it was like because maybe it was like what you said. There was so much dialogue with everybody that you encountered that those were those little down moments where you got to just spend by yourself. And then you can draw these draw these different play things and, and different like areas around you. And I don't know. I kind of really liked it. I thought it was a really neat uh, neat thing to, to add in. How would you rate this game? Three out of five. I felt that um, it's a game which I think it benefits more if you're playing it on a on a release basis than if you try and binge it. It certainly doesn't play well if you if you're binging the story because it's just so dense and heavy. The gameplay feels very very much uh, the same. It's just the only thing that's changed is really the background. So. Um, I probably would have appreciated more if I was watching this story slowly build up rather than sort of like taking this huge chunk of it and then looking back and going, oh, now I see what you were doing. So, um, yeah, it, it didn't really grab me the same. And I think it's, um, it, it, I'd say it's just a, uh, a three out of five game for myself. Yeah, I'm exactly where you are, actually. Um, maybe for a little bit of different reasons, but I mean... Because, you know, I, there were certain things I really appreciated, you know, the more, you know, the better, the be- better choice driven system. And, the, and obviously there's, there's, you know, um, the, you know, just uh, more, more options that you could have gone. And, and at the same time, it was like, there were these little knickknacks and, and the idea of, you know, bringing in that whole morality of the situation. Um, there's pros and cons to it, obviously, like I talked about before, but I mean... It's just it's just a little bit too lengthy and a little bit too much, I think. Um, but I think that, you know, a lot of this is because, like, I binged it. I binge played it. And I think that, you know, the score might have been a bit higher if we were rating it, like, episode by episode release. Um, and, wa- like, giving us time to kind of digest each one before we moved on to the next one. Because essentially, I don't know about you, but I played it in, like, over, what, five, six days or something like that. the so, same. It I found myself having to take a, a break and just do something else because it just bummed me out so bad. <laughs> well, yeah. So um, I think that about wraps up this epi- yeah. episode, right? Yeah. So if you enjoyed this episode, um, please uh, like, share, and subscribe. You can obviously listen to the podcast on on all good pl- podcasting platforms. We are on Anchor. We are on Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts. Wherever you find good podcasts, make sure you hit the like and subscribe button there. And leave us a review as it really helps raise the profile of the show. Yeah, so uh, you can find uh, you can also check all of our archives on our blog, along with other reviews and some kind of round up, roundups and other little uh, knickknacks of event coverages on gaming and such on gamewarpblog.wordpress.com. You can also find us on uh, Twitter and Facebook, where we share gaming news um, and the likes. Uh, Game Warp Podcast, and also you can check out our gaming obsessions over on Instagram, Game Warp Podcast. Till next time, bye.